Ladies and gentlemen, today I present to you a very special topic, a very first philosophy and theology video, presented to you in my slightly new studio. Yes, we're still transitioning, but it will be a good time to be had by all in today's video. The very first, most primordial of the seven deadly sins, that being lust, and not actually pride. In today's video, we're going to be delving into why is the first most deadly sin lust? Why is it not pride? We'll be giving lust a definition from what it is properly understood to be. I'm going to be delving into how we guard ourselves into a predicament of possessing the human condition and the solution. But we'll now delve into what justifies my claim? Well, many would claim that pride is the root sin. We're going to delve into the nature of pride in a later video, but we're going to be juxtaposing lust and pride today. And lust tends to be a formless wanting. The human soul broadcasting to the body and the mind that it eternally longs for an eternal satiation. These signals are either converted into intellectually or physically induced wantings intended to fill our eternal void. Whether it is conscious will or the unconscious animal in us that wants for something, the eternal void is unnatural and requires an eternal supernatural solution. In indulging in the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, we have developed gnomic will. The, with it, the ability to discern between right and wrong. We have become stained by original sin, and altogether we are now aware of our emergent imperfection. A defining feature of lust is that it always proceeds, and this is integral to my thesis, that it is preceding the six other sins, and does so as an impulse and a state of being, whereas all the other sins... They are, in fact, expressions of lust and its eternal void. Pride, being one such expression, is, in fact, an intellectual manifestation projected outward when one is watching for acknowledgement. A prideful person may puff himself up or write himself off as superior to another person, but he, in fact, lacks acknowledgement for other people or perhaps is compensating from a lack of self-esteem. And he does not know his place in the natural or the eternal order. We're going to consider, and you should too, dear viewer, the looking glass self theory of Charles Horton Cooley, in which it is revealed that humans will use each other as a means for understanding one's own self. Our perception of self is shaped foremost by how others view us, or rather how we believe the others view us. Now, a prideful man, he attempts to go against this. He attempts to resort to using a facade to fool others, and before all else, himself. This is a misguided attempt to carve out our stake in the world. In returning to lust, and to define it more clearly, it isn't only limited to sex, ladies and gentlemen. That want for another person we feel in our hearts, it is a primordial urge, yes, grafted into our very DNA. But sexual immorality, the very act of it, is in fact a form of gluttony. And because any form of sexual misconduct is actually an attempt to gain sexual gratification. And the chief end of gluttony is indulgence. It is seeking gratification in an attempt to fill the eternal void presented by lust. For many people are under the impression that in feeling good, in feeling no pain, in feeling nothing but pleasure, we are healthy and we are whole. This is not so, and only an attempt to mask the problem that plagues and ails all of humanity since the beginning, when we were first exiled from the garden. And, of course, the gluttony video 
will come very soon. But turning to the topic, ladies and gentlemen, the very basis, the concept of the bus as we know it, can be traced back to the Latin word luxuria. Does it seem familiar? Why? It is because it is the basis for the word in English, luxury. The extravagant things that we would like to have, but we cannot. But why is this so? Well, the two concepts are almost one and the same, and are reflective of my thesis that an infinite void characterized by the wanting for things that are beyond us, the goalpost is going to forever change, even when we get the things that we want the objects of our desires. You see, dear viewer, as this goalpost keeps changing, getting further and further from us, no matter how far we reach, we need the infinite solution. It is representative of an infinite void, and it is only upon setting our eyes on God as this object of our want. Can we fill the infinite void? Because, dear viewer, we are in fact our spiritual beings We've been put here on the physical plane for a physical pilgrimage, for a physical series of trials. And it's only through crossing over the bridge that Jesus himself has set down between us and God that we may have our salvation and that we may have our infinite solution. I'd like to take a moment, by the way, you're going to see a poll pop up right now. Just answer. Which sin would you like to see covered first? Greed, envy, gluttony, pride, wrath, whatever you like, you can get to it. But from what we can learn, lust was born in Adam and Eve. And with that, yes, all their sins. Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. But this was not the product of pride, because God was not a threat to self-perception, and it was not because they desperately needed to uphold the facade before God or themselves, but because they were led to believe that this forbidden fruit would grant them the ultimate power. And they were lusting for the ultimate power. They were lusting for the infinite solution. But this misguided attempt was in fact the first of many sins. And in eating this fruit, we would in fact now know that there is an infinite void between us and God, one that we have committed as original sin, one that would distance us now and forever from God. And also this event, it demonstrates that Humans covet power that is not endowed to them by God, especially things of a superhumanly nature. Nowadays, we're going to see more witchcraft, paganism. The New Age beliefs that we are all gods. These are vain attempts, grasping at different sorts of powers out there that are beyond us, but not venturing forth to the true power, the source of all power himself, God. But take a note of this, viewer. God recognizes his own, those he has bestowed the Holy Spirit onto, and it is through this helper that humanity has access to the metaphysical means to quell this beast within. And yes, so we live in a very physical, finite realm. The earth. In Hebrew, this word is aretz. Our solution is heaven sent, ladies and gentlemen. Heaven meaning Shemayim, it's a plural word. The plurality of heaven is indicative of the possibility for the infinite. When we look to the skies, when we look to God, creator of all things and infinite possibilities, the ultimate good. This is to cure for the human condition. An infinite problem. The solution. Infinite. Brought to us by the Holy Spirit. Should we join in union with God?
God, seeking after him, developing the virtues that you are now all the more present to be aware of due to the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the first steps towards becoming whole again. Now, I'd like to turn your attention to on the topic of the virtues. Chief among them in combating the seven deadly sins and the very opposite of lust is the virtue of chastity. The abstinence from sin and all things bad. For ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you right now, the one archetype, the one person that we should take after the most is in fact our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because I ask you, dear viewer, who was it who was more chaste and more based than Christ himself. Why? There is no one. And so is this life that we're to take after. Not necessarily one overruled with aesthetic, or asceticism, I should say. One not completely dominated by legalism. But one where we take after the principles that Christ lived after. We remember his conduct, and we take guidance from the divinely inspired Word of God, the Bible itself. Ladies and gentlemen, it is in confessing Jesus as Lord, our Lord and Savior, and in following him through the bridge he has established between men and God, that we are in doubt of the Holy Spirit, and greater portions of it, and we can finally begin our rehabilitation from the eternal void, from the human condition. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the human condition is in fact truly, most originally, the intent that God had for us, to be in communion with him as we lived. However, not fulfilling this imperative, we have in fact fallen ill. We are starving creatures. We lack substance. The substance that we need in order to thrive, to grow as beings, and to complete our pilgrimage and the imperatives given to us in this world. But, ladies and gentlemen, have I missed something important? Have you debunked my theory or has it to contribute to the discussion? Comment down below, like the video, subscribe for more novel content, things that I like to purvey, and go in peace, my dear brethren, until the next time.